start again. Oh, there we are. There he is. Here we are. Right. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so welcome. This is uh, for everyone. This is Walter Yena. Um, I, I probably can't do a an introduction to you service. Um, internationally recognized uh, climate scientist, um, microbiologist, worked uh, with the government of Australia for many decades, I believe. Uh, Cyro. Yeah, yeah. Um, but your message on the water cycle and its role in the climate conversation is something that uh, those who have experienced it uh, <laughs> feel the need to share. And um, I think it's a really exciting piece of this broader conversation. So that's where this is the first of I think three presentations you'll be doing with us over this eight month session. But really excited to have you on the on the water part today. Well, look, thank you very much, Dan. And, and yes, uh, as we said, look, there's a series of three talks that we decided, but this one particularly we wanted to focus on carbon. Uh, how do we get carbon into the soils and how does it affect the hydrology? And of course, through the hydrology, our climate. And really, um, we'd like to have a discussion about that particular topic, but of course, it's in the bigger context of actually regenerating uh, our soils, regenerating the earth soil carbon sponge, and how does that whole, you know, soils and vegetation regeneration movement go forward. But in terms of the climate, it's really quite fundamental because I suppose we all fully accept that we've got this fundamental problem of uh, climate change and how that's going to in fact uh, impact humanity. And of course, humanity, we have a problem. I mean, it's a, coming back a little bit to Apollo 13, you know, where they came out with a message, Houston, we have a problem 50 years ago. And of course, it was 50 years ago that Charles Keeling made it very, very clear that, look, uh, we have a problem, humanity, it's global warming. Uh, we've got the symptom, the CO2 increasing in the atmosphere. And of course, with that comes the threat of greenhouse warming. And of course, what would the consequence of that be to the world's, not just climate, but the whole agro ecosystems and sustainability of food production, sustainability of actually our whole economic civilizations. And for the last 40 years, 50 years, we've just talked about it. You know, we've had basically, well, we're going to have 26, uh, COP number 26 this year, we've been talking, 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 but effectively doing nothing. We've just been denying and delaying and not getting anywhere with this discussion. And so the question really comes, why is that so? And really where are we at now, 20, 50 years later? And of course, the problem is that we've always focused on CO2, which is effectively the symptom in the air. And what can we do about CO2? And of course, put it in this very difficult polarity of okay, we've got to reduce our fossil fuel use if we're going to reduce fossil uh, uh, emissions and CO2 levels. But of course, if we try to reduce our fossil fuel use too dramatically, we're obviously going to crash economies. And so there's been this duality between climate change and fossil fuel use, fossil fuel emissions. And of course, that's prevented everybody from actually taking action. And for 40, 50 years, we've been stuck in that I suppose, Faustian bargain, that no man's land, not moving forward. But in fact, and this is really the serious point, in fact, there's something much, much more serious that's been happening, which we've ignored and which is now coming to pass. And it was really highlighted in 2005 by the Hadley Centre in the UK that, yeah, there's CO2 increases, but in fact, it's a dangerous hydrological climate extremes that are accelerating and basically impacting societies, economies now. Basically, we've got hydrological extremes, whether it be hurricanes, floods, storms, droughts, aridification, wildfires, sea level rise, all these direct impacts are actually impacting landscapes, communities, economies now killing people and accelerating, which is a really frightening thing. And of course, this is happening now. It's not just 2100. It's not just scenarios that we modeled and say, look, some time in the future, these are actually happening now. 
And of course, with that, we're going to get the collapse of biosystems. That's already happening. Look at the wildfires. Every year, some 350 million hectares of forests burn. And they're not just burning as a single event. They're actually sort of collapsing and not regrowing anything like they did previously. So this is a very serious systemic problem. And basically, we need to find a, a solution to this urgently. But it's all about hydrology. It's not about CO2 per se. Okay, and so the question is, uh, how do we actually safely and naturally restore this hydrology? But also, how do we cool the climate? How do we actually basically step in now and say, look, where are our options to safely, naturally cool the climate to avoid these extremes accelerating? And in a sense, this becomes the key imperative. You know, uh, we've got perhaps a decade, this next decade, to say, have we put in place the processes that can cool the climate? Because if we don't, we're going to have things like wildfires, uh, floods, storms, really destroying the basis of agriculture, the basis of economies, and really keep creating serious social economic disruption. There's um, basically, if we go back to the Arab Spring, seven missed meals between social stability and chaos. And of course, once we have that social instability, because of hunger, food, agricultural breakdown, then all bets are off. Basically, it's Jared Diamond collapse. And so this is a very fundamental point. How do we actually safely, naturally cool the climate to minimize these hydrological extremes? So look, uh, it's early morning here. It's a pretty grim message, as I've outlined just in the last couple of minutes. But really, uh, it's something, it's existential. That's what we have to face. The good news is there are natural, safe solutions to do this. You know, solutions that basically within a decade can, yes, safely cool the planet, cool our climates, restore biosystems, restore hydrology. But it requires a complete different uh, way of thinking about our climate crisis. And in a sense, it's that discussion that we have to and we want to have this morning. It's, it, oh, it's, a good, it's early morning here, six o'clock in the morning in Australia. So, of course, it's three o'clock in the US PM. But so how do we actually cool the climate? What are the processes? And it's a pretty simple picture. If we go back to basics, we've obviously got a planet, the Earth, and we've got sunshine coming in continually as some 342 watts per square meter at the top of the top of the troposphere. So there's this continual incoming of solar radiation. Of course, to keep a balanced temperature on the Earth, we need to re-radiate 342 watts per square meter back out from the Earth's atmosphere, okay, to keep that heat balance. And in a sense, in reality, what we've done is because we've interfered with the greenhouse effect, we're retaining an extra, on average, three watts per square meter in the Earth's atmosphere, and that's, of course, warming the planet. There's no scientific or physical dispute about that. That's the problem. We're basically retaining some 1% or less than 1% of that incident solar radiation in the Earth's atmosphere. And, of course, the solution is we've got to get that 1% back out. And while it's significant, the bottom line is it's 1%. So it's not that we're going to have to change the whole balance of the planet, uh, you know, radically change things. It's a 1% correction on the amount of heat coming back out, being retransmitted out of the atmosphere. And of course, when we ask, well, how can we do that? It's, it's very simple. Again, we simply say, well, look, how does nature naturally regulate the Earth's climate? You know, how does nature basically manage the 342 watts coming in? And how does nature naturally basically um, cause a retransmission of 342 watts going out? 
And then it's very simple. If we can understand how nature does it, we ask the questions, what have we done to it? You know, how have we disturbed these processes? And if we have disturbed them, the question is automatically, how can we regenerate them? What can we do to our Earth's biosystems to get that 1%, that three watts per square meter back out to space? And of course, that then frames the challenges that we've got. You know, like, yep, how does nature do it? Now, again, it's, it's all very simple, scientifically confirmed, climatology 101, in fact, that basically 95% of the Earth's heat dynamics is governed by water. You know, it's water that regulates the climate of the blue planet. 95% of it, at least. The CO2 component of the greenhouse effect, of course, also contributes. It's, it's basically some less than 4% of that heat dynamics. Now, not that it's not in, unimportant, but just in terms of balanced importance, it's water that governs 95%, these hydrological processes. And of course, we've disregarded them largely because they are so dominant. You know, we've more or less made the assumption in the beginning that, look, the Earth's hydrological dynamics and heat balance is so dominated by water that we humans could not possibly have altered that. And of course, that's the assumption we made. We also made that assumption because that hydrological process is so complicated and variable and interacting in time and space all over the planet that we can't possibly model it, or we couldn't actually possibly model it 50 years ago. And so basically when we, the question was asked, actually uh, in the 1970s by Jimmy Carter and gave the reference to say, well, look, what is the impact of the CO2 rise on the Earth's climate? Everybody sort of said, yeah, like I can model the CO2 rise and its greenhouse consequences, but I can't, quantitatively mathematically model water so let's just stick on the co2 and frame the question from jimmy carter in terms of co2 rather than what has changed the earth climate we're basically in a new world now because of the as we said in the beginning the risks that are imposed and so we do have to look at these hydrological processes and if we do, then we can basically say, how have we impacted these? And yeah, what can we do to restore them? And hey, have we, have we got the options to actually alter some of them to restore this 1% heat balance in the climate? What I'd like to now do is go through actually some of these hydrological processes and just outline how they impact the climate you know, the heat dynamics, what we've done to them, and in a sense, how we, through our land management, have had a profound effect on them, but in a sense, through our land management, have the only point of agency we have to restore the Earth's climate. And in a sense, it's a very positive story, because, yeah, for the first time in 50 years, this is giving us agency. You know, we are responsible, but also we are response able. You know, we have the power just through simple land management, soil management, hydrological management changes to actually rebalance the Earth's climate. And as you see, as we go through these processes, it's as simple as growing a plant and restoring yeah, our backyards, and in that way, safely, naturally cooling the planet. So let's go through those. Now, as we all know that basically trees transpire, uh, water evaporates, and that transpiration and evaporation of water from the land surface and the ocean surface, but we're talking mainly land here because that's the point where we have agency, that basically takes water from the soil up into the atmosphere. But to do that, it has to convert that water from liquid to a gas, water vapor. And to make that conversion, basically 
each gram of water that has transpired or evaporated has to have some 590 calories of heat energy to convert it from liquid to gas. And of course, that 590 calories of energy has to come from the land surface and obviously in transpiring, cooling that surface. So we've got this natural air conditioning effect as water transpires, evaporates, it takes heat from the surface back up into the upper air. And that process globally for half, I mean, for the residual vegetation on the planet takes 24% of the incident solar radiation that we get from the sun back from the earth, from the soil surface, back up into the atmosphere. So that single process takes quarter of the earth, I mean, the the energy the earth is receiving back from the surface up into the atmosphere so it's profound but what's also profound is that we're basically now operating on perhaps 50 percent of the vegetation across the earth's surface that there was 10,000 years ago so even that residual vegetation transpiration is doing 24 percent so it stands to reason just by increasing the area of transpiring green land cover, we can enhance that cooling effect, that transpiration, uh, latent heat cooling effect. Okay, and so it comes down to a 4% increase in vegetation cover, both in area and in time, could actually offset the 1% heating that we've affected on the globe. And that's profound, you see. So 4% increase of vegetation in time over and, and on an area basis could, in a sense, offset this global warming crisis that we've had. And it's such a simple and profound statement that it's almost too good to believe, isn't it? That, hey, we, through our land management, can have such immediate and direct effects. But this is just one of the processes that hydrology works through. And let me go through sort of seven of the other processes. They all work in sequence. And so this hydrological cooling thing is actually a sequence of hydrological processes. Some of them are cooling, some of them have warming effects, but in net, their net effect is to actually regulate 95% of the heat dynamics of the planet. Okay, the second sort of process we want to go through as that water is transpired from vegetation and evaporation into the air, then of course it enters the atmosphere and how it, what it forms in the atmosphere and how long it stays in the atmosphere has a profound effect again on the climate. Because if we put a lot of pollutant particles into the air, you know, dust, aerosols, micronuclei, then that water that's transpired into the air forms humid hazes, you know, mist hazes, very, very small micro droplets. And these are persistent humid haze micro droplets. And these hazes, in fact, are significant in warming the Earth's climate. So in a sense, the longer and the more humid hazes we have in the atmosphere, these pollutant hazes, the bigger their warming effect is. We've got figures from global dimming research and up to 20% of the incident solar radiation the earth gets can be absorbed regionally by these humid hazes and in so doing warming the planet. So there's an enormous value in actually saying, okay, if we don't want that warming, we don't need those humid hazes, obviously they're polluting, but basically the fewer hazes for shorter, over shorter regional areas, the better. And of course we can remove those humid hazes from the air by actually the third hydrological process. And this is in a sense just simply coalescing those haze micro droplets into larger cloud droplets and those larger cloud droplets then forming dense high albedo clouds 
which reflect incident solar radiation directly back out to space. Okay, so as the water gets transpired from the surface through trees, through evaporation, goes into the air, it can either form these hazes which warm, or then the hazes can get converted into clouds. And actually, the clouds can have a profound, rapid cooling effect on the Earth's planet. You'll know that basically, when a cloud comes over you, you know, dense cloud comes over you, it can drop temperatures almost immediately 5, 10 degrees centigrade. You know, you have to put on a jumper because it's got that much cooler within minutes. And of course, these clouds, high albedo reflective clouds, they naturally cover 50% of the Earth's surface at any one time. And they naturally reflect up to 33% of the incident solar radiation that the Earth is getting from the sun directly back out to space, preventing that radiation warming the surface. So here we have another fundamental process in nature. 33% of the incident solar radiation is regulated on average by clouds, and therefore the length, extent, and density of the clouds has a profound effect on changing our regional climates. And again, that we have enormous agency over this cloud formation, both in the amount of uh, transpiration, evaporation that we're inducing, but also in the formation of these clouds, because it's actually precipitation nuclei. Uh, I mean, we'll get into the details of this, but basically for, water, for cloud droplets to form, they need to coalesce these haze micro droplets and turn these micro droplets, haze micro droplets into larger droplets by hygroscopically coalescing millions of these haze droplets to form a cloud droplet. And there's a very fundamental natural process that does that. Uh, these um, hygroscopic part, oh, nuclei, uh, precipitation nuclei, and it's a formation of precipitation nuclei that has a profound effect then in cloud formation and as we'll say later on in rainfall formation. There's three things in nature that actually act as these precipitation nuclei. Ice crystals and they're fundamental at high latitudes and high altitudes. You know, as things get colder, water will freeze and then the ice crystals will form precipitation nuclei. Of the ocean, salts are very, very important. So basic salt spray will put sodium chloride into the atmosphere as small particles. And of course, the sodium chloride is highly hygroscopic and serves as precipitation nuclei. But over basically tropical regions, inland regions, but particularly forested regions, there's another category of precipitation nuclei bacteria from forests that are transpired as part of the transpiration stream. And these bacteria are extremely hygroscopic and extremely effective as precipitation nuclei condensing clouds, haze droplets into clouds. So again, we've got our land management of vegetation having a profound effect in cloud formation and of course, in that cloud formation cooling. We just follow that same logic forward. And of course, it's the same precipitation nuclei that are then responsible for the Earth's rainfall. Okay, rain is of course water falling out of the sky under gravity. But to do that, it has to be in droplets that are large and heavy enough for gravity to take them out of the air. And of course, Basically, um, to do that, we have to have these both um, haze nuclei and cloud nuclei, which become coalesced to form larger raindrops. And of course, that process is again is driven by these precipitation nuclei. So rainfall can't occur without these precipitation nuclei. And again, it's our management of land systems producing these precipitation nuclei 
that govern how much rain falls. And so again, we've got this profound, critically important thing of rainfall, because obviously without the rainfall falling on the land, being available for transpiration, we don't even have this whole hydrological cycle. Okay, so this is important because it's in a sense the generation of rain that gives you the hydrology in your soils to allow this whole cooling cycle to operate. So the, the production of these precipitation nuclei becomes critical for actually rainfall, for soil recharge, and of course, this whole cooling transpiration cycle that we've talked about. So look here, the first day, the first uh, sequence of um, processes, but we then go further. Once we have soils retaining moisture, then obviously they can have a vegetation cover. They can support and grow a green protective soil cover. And again, that protective soil cover by vegetation has a profound effect in keeping those soils cooler. Okay, both in terms of the vegetation reflecting uh, radiation from that soil surface through albedo effects, but most importantly through this transpiration cooling effect. And so a protected vegetated surface, just say grass cover, the soils will rarely get above 20 degrees centigrade in temperature. By contrast, if we have bare exposed soil without water, without cover, the sun bearing down on those soils, that heat will get absorbed and those soils can raise in their temperature so that you can't walk on them. Um, in Queensland, Northern Australia, up to 70 degrees centigrade. But a profound difference in the soil temperature, depending on whether it is vegetated, covered and protected. Okay, so the effect of water, vegetation, soil protection profoundly affects the temperature that those soils can get to because of incident solar radiation impacts, absorption. And it's again, a simple law of physics that the amount of uh, the temperature of the uh, soils has a profound influence on the amount of re-radiation from those soils. Now, this is a simple, uh, simple um, process called under the Stefan Boltzmann black body radiator effect, where the amount of re-radiation from a surface, such as a soil or any, any body, in fact, is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. Now, it's a simple equation. Re-radiation <clears throat> re is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature in degrees Kelvin. Now, that means effectively that hot surfaces will re-radiate vastly more heat back into the atmosphere than cooler surfaces, uh, as governed by the fourth power of the temperature. That's temperature times temperature times temperature times temperature. So mathematically, it's quite simple, quite inescapable. We've got massively more re-radiation from hot surfaces than we have from cool surfaces. And again, it's inescapable law of physics. And this has a profound, a profound effect actually on the greenhouse effect and the Earth's climate. Because the greenhouse effect is an effect, the amount of re-radiation coming from the earth multiplied by the percentage of that re-radiation, which is absorbed by greenhouse gases in the air. And we've all focused on greenhouse gases in the air. Most of our focus has been on CO2 as a greenhouse gas, which is absolutely valid. It absorbs about 11% of the re-radiation. Water vapor is actually the dominant greenhouse gas, which absorbs 80% of the re-radiation. 
And then, of course, methane and other trace gases absorb about 9% of the re-radiation. Okay, so we've focused on this 11% of the gas re uh, absorption effect. But by far, by far, the dominant factor governing the greenhouse effect is the amount of re-radiation. Now, whether the actual re-radiation is on high or is on simmer. It's a bit like a stove. You know, have we got our stove turned up on ultra high or is it turned up on simmer? And the point is that we govern how high that stove is turned up, how much re-radiation is coming from the earth according to the earth's temperature, the soil temperature. So what we've been talking about, we actually govern the temperature of the soil by our land management through our moisture retention and protective soil cover. That governs the actual re-radiation, and it's that re-radiation that is the key dominant factor in the greenhouse effect. So when you bring that all down, we can effectively turn off or significantly turn down the Earth's greenhouse effect simply by keeping soils cool, simply by not mowing your lawns. Now, it's a bit radical, isn't it? Not mowing your lawns, but simply by keeping soils cool, moist, protected, sheltered, stopping their temperatures going up, we can actually turn down the Earth's greenhouse effect. We can do that irrespective of how much CO2 is in the air, because it's only 11% of that gas absorption effect. The real thing is dominated by how much re-radiation is coming from the Earth. And so this is a profound, because this gives us agency, right? We through our land management, what we do to our soils, whether we cover them, vegetate them, whether we rehydrate them to, by keeping them, by doing that and keeping them cool, we are actually directly, profoundly influencing the greenhouse effect and the Earth's climate. You see, and this is really critical because now Instead of saying, hey, we've got to stop all fossil fuel use to try to stop all emissions, which we know is impossible because of we, we were more or less crashing all our economies. But more than that, because the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is governed certainly by emissions, but also by a very, very powerful buffered system. OK, um, there's 750 billion tons of carbon dissolved to CO2 in the atmosphere. So CO2 in the atmosphere, um, 750 billion tons of carbon in the atmosphere is CO2. But there's some 38,000 billion tons of carbon dissolved as, uh, as dissolved CO2 in the world's oceans. Okay, that's 50 times more carbon in the world's ocean than in the world's atmosphere. And as we draw carbon out of the atmosphere, or we reduce our emissions of carbon into the atmosphere, the oceans will really just re-equilibrate carbon back into the atmosphere in a buffered system. So what that means is even any effort to just draw down or reduce emissions will be again, uh, re-equilibrated by the Earth's buffering, of, uh, by, by the Earth's oceans and their buffering effects. So it will take centuries or thousands of years for CO2 emission reductions by themselves to try and reduce the Earth's climate, or reduce the Earth's warming. Okay, and so it's a very, very ineffective and very, very slow process, and nowhere near able to avoid the increasing in temperatures, you know, like the dangerous increase in temperatures that we're already experiencing. Temperatures have gone up 1.2 degrees centigrade up to now. We've got the Paris COP21 
analyses that if we go above 1.5 degrees temperature rise globally average, then we're heading into all, let, all levels of dangerous, uh, dangerous climate effects, particularly these dangerous hydrological extremes that we talked about in the beginning. So the bottom line is we can't get there just through CO2 emissions per se, just by reducing the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, but we can turn down the greenhouse effect rapidly, instantly, practically, by redu reducing the re-radiation of heat that drives the greenhouse effect. So by keeping soils hydrated, protected, covered, cooler, we can actually directly slow down that greenhouse effect. This um, has, again, profound effects. There's another uh, fundamental sort of heat process that comes into it now. When we basically remove water from the atmosphere through rainfall, we also actually reopen radiation windows at nighttime to allow heat to re-radiate from the earth back out to space during the night. Okay, so it's basically, we've got um, this blanket, these greenhouse gases in the air, mainly water vapor, also CO2, of course, but by removing that greenhouse gas, particularly the water vapor component from the air, through rainfall, we are really reopening or allowing more heat to re-radiate from the earth back out to space. And by reopening these nighttime re-radiation windows, we can, again, further cool the planet. 60% of the global warming that we've monitored to date globally has come through increased nighttime temperatures. Okay, it's basically our increased retention of heat over the night times, the night's not getting as cool as they did before, is basically governing 60% of the heating of the planet. And this is telling us that basically, yep, we've been keeping more moisture in the air so that water vapor component of the greenhouse gas effect is becoming stronger. But if we can remove that water through rainfall, then we can get more of that heat coming out. And so again, there's another important hydrological process that we've disturbed, that we've altered, which we can again restore, regenerate to help cool the planet. Again, that, that nighttime radiation window effect governs some 20% of the retransmission of heat from the earth back out to space. So again, as we've gone through these sequence of hydrological processes, here's another one that nature uses to naturally safely cool the planet. And again, we can do that restoring those processes, rebalancing those processes as nature did, and basically in that way, cooling the planet. So what we've been talking about is this whole sequence of uh, physics and basically heat dynamics, whereby it's the hydrology of the planet that governs, you know, each of these sequential components adding up to some 95% of its heat dynamics. And what we've been talking about is how we, through our land management, directly and profoundly influence those processes. We've obviously disturbed those processes, but we now have the capacity through regenerating them, through understanding and regenerating them to say, look, we can restore these hydrological cooling processes. And in a sense, that gives us profound agency, which we've never had before, because up to now, we've only been given that option of saying, hey, We've got to reduce emissions, but in doing that, we've got to stop fossil fuel use. And in doing that, we have to significantly crash economic activities, whereas now we have this other powerful, much, much more powerful, much safer, totally natural way
to say, look, we can actually restore the Earth's hydrology and therefore it's cooling and, of course, our secure future. Now, that's all well and good, but it then sort of says, well, what do we have to do? You know, how can we do that? And this is, in a sense, coming to the punchline because to have these hydrological processes operating, we really need water in our soils. That goes without saying, isn't it? The whole process is driven by rainfall, falling, infiltrating, being retained in our soils, because only then can we have these transpiration fluxes that give us a cooling. Only then can we have the vegetation cover over the land to reduce the amount of re-radiation from these soils. So it's the retention of water in our soils that becomes our key point of action. Now that becomes a key action imperative. So in another words, that brings down to this very simple thing that links back to carbon now, it's all about restoring, regenerating the Earth's soil carbon sponge. Now, that becomes the key action item, action priority, because if we can restore the Earth's soil carbon sponge, it can retain the water that we need for these cooling processes. And so restoring the Earth's soil carbon sponge becomes, in a sense, our, yeah, our action imperative. And of course, that's exactly what we've been championing in natural land management to do. You know, can we get carbon from the air back into the soils to rebuild the sponge? And it's important to stress that it's that action of putting carbon into the sponge, rebuilding those soils, rebuilding the hydrological infiltration, retention, transpiration potential that matters, not just carbon accounting. You know, it's not good enough to just say, look, we, we're accounting for carbon. We put so many tons of carbon away in some locked up form. It's actually regenerating the Earth's soil carbon sponge is where we have agency, where we have uh, a capacity to function. It's actually taking Charles Keeling's symptom, the CO2 increase, and recognizing it is actually the resource. It is a point of agency we have of taking that carbon from the air and using it to rebuild the Earth's soil carbon sponge. And that action is really what gives us agency and power and is our capacity to actually safely naturally cool the planet. Which then opens the next question, of course, well, how do we do this? You know, how do we regenerate the Earth's soil carbon sponge everywhere, rapidly, productively, naturally? And again, it's so, so elementary and simple then, well, we do it just as nature does. And as nature did for the last 420 million years on land, how nature draw down, draws down carbon from the air to rebuild soils. And of course it does it as we can do through plants, simply by growing plants, simply by photosynthesis and the function of plants taking CO2, water, sunlight, and converting them into biomass, you know, drawing down carbon. And of course, it's all about maximizing then the growth of green plants on this land surface. As I said in the beginning, we're now operating with some 50%. So we basically have got half the green vegetation that we did 10,000 years ago on this planet. But the point is, that's what we've got. And so how do we maximize the area, the uh, effectiveness of that green growth, but also the longevity of that green growth? Okay, we always see things in terms of area and speed. But in fact, it's the length of time that plants are growing for, which is really the profound opportunity and response you know we can grow things for 20 days after rain or we can grow things for 200 days after rain 
depending on how much water is in the soil supporting that growth. So the longevity of green growth becomes a powerful, powerful sort of point of agency and tool that we have. But all the time it's maximizing green growth. But it's not just as simple as maximizing green growth, right? Okay, because that's biomass, we can produce biomass, but then it's also ensuring that that biomass that we produce doesn't get oxidized rapidly back to CO2. Because if it just gets converted into biomass and then we burn it or we oxidize it back to CO2, we actually haven't achieved very much. We've got to microbially convert that biomass into stable soil carbon. Okay, so rather than letting it oxidize, we've got to sort of maximize the conversion of that biomass into stable soil carbon so it stays in that soil to rebuild the sponge and to basically give us stable soil carbon, 100,000 years longevity. And of course, again, nature does that beautifully through converting all that biomass through microbes into humates and glomalin and these stable soil carbon sponges. And so again, in our land management, our imperative priority is to say, right, let us not oxidize this, let's not burn this biomass straight back to CO2, but instead convert most of it into stable soil carbon. Our current industrial agriculture, of course, is turning most of the biomass we produce directly back into CO2, basically by burning, clearing, cultivation, over fertilization, biocides, bare fallows, all of these processes in industrial agriculture, in fact, just accelerating the oxidation of carbon, not just the biomass we grow, but also heritage legacy carbon in our soil back into CO2. So basically what we've been doing over the last 8,000 years, but particularly the last 200 years of industrial agriculture, is just oxidizing our plant production, oxidizing our stable soil carbon from previous back into the atmosphere. And of course, it's that mass oxidation of industrial agriculture that really drove most of the rise in CO2 levels that Charles Keeling showed us. Certainly fossil fuel has added to that, but it's only fairly recently, the last 70 years or so, prior to that, most of the CO2 rise was driven by agriculture and our excessive burning oxidation of biosystems and soils. And so really it's that whole process of minimizing that oxidation in our land management practices and maximizing the investment, the conversion, the bioconversion of that biomass carbon into our soils, which is where we again have that agency. And of course, if we do so, then it's extremely beneficial because for every gram of carbon that we can put into the soil as stable soil carbon to rebuild the sponge, for every gram of that carbon, we can massively increase the water holding capacity of those soils. Each gram of carbon in itself holds as sponge, as organic matter, humates, glomin in itself holds four grams of extra water, but if it creates well-structured uh, three-dimensional soils, it can hold up to 20 grams per gram of carbon added to the soil. Profound positive multiplier. Every gram of carbon we put in the soils can massively increase the surface area exposure of minerals in the soil, just simply through their three-dimensional matrix ex exposure and massively increase the biofertility of that soil without adding extra nutrients. You know, just by making those mineral surfaces more available for solubilization, access, uptake by microbes for nutrient cycling. Every gram of carbon we put into the soil massively increases the rootability of those soils. 
the capacity for roots to proliferate to depth so that we're using you know three meters of soil through roots rather than just 20 centimeters on the surface so basically by increasing the investment of carbon into the soils we can massively increase the productivity of photosynthesis of plant production above the ground and of course we by doing that can negate the need for all those industrial imports you know the fertilizer the cultivation the biocides the fallowing which are currently oxidizing most of the carbon out of our soils so again changes in agricultural practices can have profound effects increasing the amount of carbon in soils we, we see that our leading farmers in australia but the same in america canada etc all across the planet they're demonstrating clearly that these innovative soil carbon practices can sequester up to 10 tons of carbon per hectare per annum sustainably into soils you know and that's basically really rebuilding soil health rapidly nature did the same thing i mean nature took for example waterlogged eroded glacial till sludges uh, basically from post-glacial environments in north america and turned them into deep 10 meter prairie soils with 10 percent carbon levels in the space of eight thousand years and so again nature's used exactly the same processes to rapidly build high carbon soils, very, very productive soils. We can do that as well. Our innovative leading uh, regenerative farmers are doing that, 10 tonnes of carbon per hectare per annum. We won't go through all the details on this, but globally, there's no question we've got the analyses and basically we can readily buy a sequester and actually draw down 20 billion tons of carbon per annum back into the soils to, through the global extension of these regenerative agricultural practices. You know, basically converting biomass carbon into humates, glomalin, soil carbon sponges rather than oxidizing them into the air that 20 billion tons of carbon per annum would get us into very globally into negative net emissions in a significant way. At the moment, some 8 billion tons of carbon per annum are being emitted through fossil fuel use, for example, and the 20 billion tons carbon drawdown would more than offset all that fossil fuel emissions. Now, we're not saying we don't need to reduce fossil fuel emissions. Of course we do. Every little bit helps. But what I'm saying is we can extend our agency well beyond just stopping fossil fuel use. We can go into regenerating biosystems to pull this carbon out of the air, 20 billion tonnes, and restore healthy biosystems. But at the same time, by restoring those healthy biosystems, restore their hydrology and their cooling effects because it's that cooling effect that's going to be imperative if we're going to avoid these dangerous hydrological climate extremes. So basically coming to, to the end of this exercise or this discussion before we go into Q&A and uh, actually explore these further is really making the very clear point that, look, as in nature, we can use the same process that nature used to create the terrestrial biosystems on the planet, the same process that nature has used repeatedly after hurricanes, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanism, the same process that we can use to rebuild the Earth's soil carbon sponge. And by doing that, to rebuild the Earth's hydrology, to rehydrate landscapes, you know, rehydrate those 5 billion hectares, 40% of the land's surface area that we've converted into desert and wasteland. And we can basically rehydrate and regenerate these landscapes 
to rebuild the earth's hydrology and safe climate, cooling and safe climate. And so it's really quite profound because we're saying we have the agency, we have the capability just through wise ecological land management to actually turn this planet around to naturally safely cool it this decade, but also provide the food, the water, the biosystems, the stability, the resilience that we need for our survival. We can be absolutely certain that within this decade, if we don't do this, we are going to sort of be coming under extreme hydrological pressures from hurricanes, floods, storms, droughts, aridification, wildfires, and these things are going to collapse the fundamental biosystems we depend on. All our economies, all our societies are simply functions of ecosystems. We depend fundamentally on the health of these ecosystems, these biosystems, these natural systems for our survival. And basically we're saying we must regenerate these we can regenerate these. It's now critical. We have 10 years. So really, how do we go about doing it? And so I'd like to just sort of look at, well, what are some of the 10? Well, actually, I'll just condense it to eight key action agencies that we need to do practically everywhere to do that. And the first thing we have to do really is, yeah, we've got to urgently, rapidly cool regions and the climate to avoid these and to buffer these dangerous hydrological extremes. And of course, we can do that practically as we've outlined through rebuilding the sponge. And it's as simple, for example, as restoring urban forests or forests or woodlands wherever we can, because it's those transpiring trees that we talked about, which can give us that very rapid, very significant cooling effect. The same thing as not just urban forest, is just making, keeping land protected, sheltered, moister and covered, so it doesn't re-radiate the heat that it currently is. So just basically using those hydrological processes to cool our regional habitats, and that can be as we said, our urban areas, our peri-urban areas, our backyards. The second thing we can do that's really significant and has to be done, we actually have to stop these wildfires that are now destroying 350 million hectares of forest land every year. That's about 10% of our residual forests on this planet, 10% are burning every year. And we've got to basically reduce these wildfires because these wildfires are actually the collapse phase of those forests. If we allow them to repeat regularly, those forests are going to collapse back to drier, poorer biosystems. And we can do that by basically beautiful little ecologies. Instead of burning that fuel, we can accelerate its bioconversion through fungi into stable soil carbon. So it's a question of fire versus fungi. Can we use fungi to actually incorporate more of that fire fuel back into soil, not just to remove the fuel, but to increase the sponge, to increase the hydrology and protect those forests from burning. A third fundamental uh, opportunity, powerful opportunity is urban agriculture, right? How do we actually re-empower the 7 billion people by 2050 that will be living in urban environments? Okay, we're going to have some 10 billion people by 2050 on forward projections prior to COVID, but let's hope so. 10 billion people on this planet by 2050 over 70% will be living in urban areas. So 7 billion people, and how do we empower them through urban agriculture to not just be growing their own nutritious food, which is another story, but also 
recycling and composting their organic waste to build sponges, to rebuild that urban food system. And if we do that again, there's a profound capacity to basically rebuild soils, rebuild hydrology, empower people, and actually help secure the future. Um, the same thing goes right across the world in terms of village agriculture. You know, how do we actually help regenerate more viable, decentralized village agricultural systems so people can have the nutritional integrity and the food security that they need? But we'll be talking about that in a future talk. We now also have an enormous potential by using these, um, these innovative land regenerative practices. Can we regenerate some of that 5 billion hectares of man-made desert and wasteland that we've created over the last 8,000 years? Can we regenerate that back, back to sort of stable grasslands, rangelands, but most importantly, provide the protection the rehydration and the cooling of those soils so that 5 billion hectares aren't re-radiating heat at extreme levels back into the air to drive the greenhouse effect. Uh, another big change that we need and can go with is can we actually review and change the metrics that we use in government and industry at the moment, we're externalizing most of the consequences of our action to the environment, to the taxpayer and to our children. And we're not taking responsibility for the consequences through false accounting. And so by changing the metrics, by changing the accounting system, can we actually not just take responsibility, but re-empower us to be response able to address these questions, because while we, in a sense, subsidize, protect, distort, deny, deny through false metrics, we're just deluding ourselves and dictating our collapse. And then can we basically foster this eco innovation right across the area, whether it's soil carbon farm, farming, whether it's urban agriculture, whether it's recycling, you know, how do we basically help re-empower eco-enterprise right across the communities, particularly among youth, particularly among women, so that basically this can the, become the crucible, the foundation of a whole regenerative agriculture. So all these parts, uh, these practical, local, direct actions uh, all about empowering communities and collectively they can, as we've sort of said in Regenerate Earth, draw down up to 20 billion tonnes of carbon per annum back into our soils to rebuild the sponge, to rebuild the hydration and to provide that safe natural cooling that we need desperately this decade. We can do it. Uh, it's actually all practical, it's all profitable, it's all totally feasible and safe, but really the critical thing is just doing it, just empowering communities everywhere to do this, to say, look, we have agency through our soils, through our land management, through regeneration, and if we don't do that, basically it's game over because business as usual, this is so important, business as usual, isn't going to get us there. Business as usual within a decade will dictate more dangerous hydrological extremes and with that biosystems collapsing. So this is, we're at the sort of tipping point. We're on the edge of the cliff, more than on the edge of the cliff. And really it's this land regeneration, regenerating the earth soil carbon sponge, hydrology and cooling that is actually the hope for the future. So with that, look, I'd like to end the discussion, but really now open it up for a Q&A because these are quite, not radical, but they're quite challenging new Ooh. perspectives. And obviously there's perhaps a lot of questions. So yes, please ask any questions. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Walter. <laughs> Every time I hear you uh, explain this, it all sinks in a little bit deeper. And I remember a few more 
of the you know sort of factoids that I can use with other people. But you know, it is a, a very. I mean, it's a bit of a of a head shift for people who have not been exposed to this um, to really understand. I mean, I think you convey it well verbally, but it still does require a certain amount of um, cognizing in your mind. There's a question here. Um, I can't remember. Uh, let me just see if I can pull it up again. Um, Bill uh, Mars uh, said, I wish you had visual aids like charts and notes. Um, I'm, I know you're probably like me and that when you're speaking, it can only come if it's like, if you're present with what's coming through you and having a, a PowerPoint really uh, <laughs> sort of, you know, affects your, affects your, your flow. But I'm sure you put some things together for those who do want to know more about what you've done. Do you have websites? Do you have recordings? Do you have, you know, this kind of stuff captured in a way that people can digest in other formats besides just watching you? Yep. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you for the question. Absolutely. You're right. Uh, and your point too, Dan, look, we are building a whole new paradigm here. It looks, there's another way of looking at it. I certainly agree with the visuals and, and I agree uh, it's more or less the formatting. Look, there are a lot of YouTube videos. If you go to regenerate-earth, that's a website where we've got, in a sense, that, uh, you know, like there, and there's a whole lot of YouTube videos, lectures at Harvard and what have you, where we have actually, yes, got those accompanying graphics and visuals and stuff like that clearly outlined, right? Yeah. Um, it's just a matter of trying to condense this all into a, you know, this this talk and then the Q and A, uh, and a lot, obviously the visuals go into a lot more detail on the processes. But look, yes, I'd recommend go to that site, Regenerate Dash Earth, and on that you'll see there's a link to a whole lot of YouTubes and what have you, and there's different lectures and talks with all those graphics and visuals presented uh, some of them are a little bit longer because obviously you're getting into more detail on each of the processes but look please understand yes this is a paradigm change and by no means uh yeah by no means don't we want that discussion and that further inquiry of each of these points uh each of these points to comes to the question of okay how do i use that scientifically verified processes and apply that locally to make the changes I want to make. And that's again, very valid, right? Uh, not each of these processes applies everywhere and some are more important than others, depending on where you are. And yeah. so we've gone through the whole range of them, but as in nature, you know, different processes have different relevance and importance in different places. Great. I'll just um, thank you. And it's regenerate-earth.au or dot. No, just regenerate. No, just re regenerate-earth on the website, right? I'm not sure that's a URL, but are people will be able to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Right. I've got about 17 questions here in about 20 minutes. Um, so I'm going to try to run through them quickly and we'll see how many we can, we can engage. Um, Elul uh, Wintermeyer. Dr. Yena, thank you for bringing this information and message down to the grassroots, making it accessible to non-scientists. What kind of feedback are you getting from the scientific community on this to make wide-scale right. governments will look at the scientific consensus, I assume. Are you able to convince the researchers and mobilize them? Of course, if I okay, look, is, yeah, you know the question. Yeah, very, very, no, thank you very much. Yeah, look, very important question and it's very significant. Look, we've been talking about this, you know, it's building up and we've been talking for 10 years in this area and it's absolutely clear that no, there is no scientific disagreement whatsoever. There's been no scientific rejection of any of this. In fact, it's all totally verified science, right? I mean, it's just that we have framed our climate discussion for the last 50 years in the context of CO2 and its greenhouse effect. Okay, it was, as we said, Jimmy Carter, not that he's to blame, but he sort of asked the question, what is the significance of this CO2 greenhouse effect to the future of our climate, the future of America? And in that context, it was framed as a CO2 greenhouse component. 
everybody in science climatology recognizes no climate is driven by this wider larger hydrological process or the sequence of processes no dispute whatsoever and the only question has been okay uh, we've never considered agency through these hydrological processes they're too complicated to model and therefore everything is focused on co2 and of course fossil fuel emission reductions and it's how we frame the questions politically that has actually locked us into this black hole where we can't we can't solve the problem through the co2 and it's really now here's a ladder to get out of the black hole because we need to we've only got a decade and as in nature, we can hydrologically cool. So it's really no dispute at all in science. There's obviously technical questions about, does this process have this effect in this region to the extent, you know, which process is more effective where? There's a lot of detail there, fully agreed, but no dispute about the science of anything we've said at all. And not one, there's not been one rejection there's secondly there's been a lot of questions about can you give me more data on this process at three decimal places etc cetera, etc cetera, right in detail detail and some of them like the actual precipitation nuclei uh rainfall induction biological microbial rainfall induction yeah there's more we need to know i mean that's that goes with all science but there's no dispute at all about any of the science all right. Well, I guess the question is, I mean, I, there's a response here from Ian Graham. Um, he says, not true that there has been no scientific rejection of the Yenna hypothesis. All others make carbon a cause, not an effect. Name one scientist who has gotten off the carbon bandwagon and onto the water theory. So a little bit of pushback. Well, um, well hang on. <laughs> that's not science. That's, that's the, You're now taking a look. Okay, here's our populist dogma. <laughs> and, and you're saying, okay, and what is the, what is the number who is staying on the convention on who are looking at the innovative by definition the innovative are always not the status quo yes thank you i just uh, a softball well well <laughs> hit <laughs> um i'm seeing a few uh people posting links here in both the q a and the chat uh regenerate-earth.org um and samantha has a few links to other youtubes of yours she's posted in the in the q a um and ian, ian has as well um so that's that's great that people are are engaging the conference the conversation there um okay um from lenore uh can you ex elaborate on practical applications re a few action agencies one what specific false metrics and how do we persuade policymakers in this paradigm shift and what references links can you offer for them to understand more about the hydrological cycles uh two right and three fostering eco enterprise Right. Okay. So, look. Certainly, as far as governments and the whole policy debate, this is where the metrics is so so critical. Because, see, we define problems in a certain way. If we externalize other factors, you know, basically say, look, these are the consequences. Oh, we won't consider those as part of the equation. We create actually completely false uh, analyses or very limited analyses on that point. And so basically the business of policy change, yeah, we have to change the metrics and we have to take a lot of these externalities and say, look, they matter. We are responsible. What are we doing? And for example, the simple thing is we, we frame the whole thing as CO2 greenhouse. We put it all in scenarios of what's going to happen in 2100, which is, you know, kicking the can down the road. And so in a sense, we've denied the responsibility of action. And now we've got this scenario, we've had the warning since 2005, dangerous hydrological climate extremes. And we're coming to the point now where these things are impacting. And we're sort of asking the question, well, hang on, uh, we, weren't talked, we weren't told about hydrological extremes, we were told about CO2 and warming. Yeah, and the, you see, and so it's how we frame in policy the problems that then governs what are we prepared to look at as solutions. And at the moment, we're still very, very narrow 
and blinding ourselves to the reality. So as far as catalyzing the changes for policy, for government, it's these metrics that are critical and just facing up to, yeah, the reality that this decade we need to make the changes because otherwise, as we're saying with wildfires, we'll have lost the bias systems we rely on. Yeah. As far as other points of practical agency, certainly that's what I tried to end up with. Yes, here are the, the you know, the, the practical actions, cooling, urban areas, urban agriculture, you know, all the practical grassroots points of intervention, because of course we've got to look at the planet, but actually each of these is a collective net result of lots of local actions at the grassroots level. Um, and just so there's a question to that effect, uh, P. Roberts. So local ap actions help rain. If a town of 26,000 does all they can to rebuild soil, hydrology, and grow their own food, will their local climate be protected? Or will, or will we be affected by the lack of action in Boston? So that's sort of, you know, you know, wh at what scale and, you know, at what regional, I think this is a, a very important question is talking about- Oh, yeah. Heat island. No, no, look, it, it is. And it's, it's yeah. sort of one of these very difficult ones to answer. Yes, it operates locally, right? If you can plant a tree in your backyard, you can sit under the shade of the tree. If you've got moist, saturated soil rather than bare soil, you're going to be even in that 100 square meters in a much, much moister, protected, buffered environment. Now, obviously, you can extend that to say, yes, I can do that in my city. I live in Canberra. It was established 100 years ago as an urban forest deliberately because it was in a pretty dry, harsh environment. It's now 12 degrees centigrade cooler on a hot summer's day than the concrete jungle, new suburbs without that for urban forest protection next door, right? So, yes, you have these local microclimate effects. The question then comes at the bigger scale, when do we start influencing rainfall? You know, yes, that has to happen at a larger catchment scale, not just your backyard, obviously. But basically, we have rain evidence of rainfall. Yeah, look, here is just say um, 10,000 square, uh, 10,000 hectares of land regeneration. Yes, it's having an effect on rainfall, right? So things operate at different scales, but certainly the action has to be at, at each square meter, at each sort of each house lot, at each suburb. Yeah. And yes, you're going to get dividends at every level, but different things step in. If we're talking about things like restoring monsoons, which again, we didn't talk about, then we're talking obviously continental scale. Yeah. I'm just going to move along a little bit. If we, people keep posting yep. questions here. You're, you're getting a lot of engagement here. Um, from Catherine, I think it's good to just repeat this. I don't follow the global, global warming aspect. Since temperature drives water vapor in the atmosphere, even if you pull massively more water onto land, oceans will provide all the evaporation needed to drive water vapor into the atmosphere. So doesn't that come right back to dealing with long-lived greenhouse gases, CO2 primarily, um, as a driver that needs to be disrupted? I don't think she follows the cloud formation and the the phase shift and the the heat uh, transition. Yeah, look, absolutely. you're absolutely right. That piece for people. Yeah, no, look, she's absolutely right. I mean, she's saying yes. Of course, as it get warmer, oceans evaporate more water. It's what happens to that water. Does it form clouds? Does it recondense as rain, or does it stay up there as with pollution as humid hazes? Can, and providing a continual warming. So yes, each of these processes has their own dynamics. The first question is absolutely right. That's where you could spend actually literally a whole hour talking about the dynamics of each of the processes with detailed diagrams and what have you. Yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, I just see the post from uh, Shanna on the, on the, uh, the, the chat saying David Ellison, Jen Picorni and Hannah Hurian, Harina are, are people who have verified some of the work that you've been doing for those who have that question. Uh, we've got one from uh, Cal, very short. Is the UN or FAO on board with your hydrological analysis? I'm sure you have conversations. Uh, well, look, okay. So are they on board? Yes, they're looking at that. I mean, make no mistake, there's enormous interest in now, I mean, 
we've, we're changing the whole debate, okay? The number of people, research institutes in the UN, Europe, elsewhere, that are exploring now these hydrological dynamics has gone up exponentially. So it's like that in science, right? Here's actually a new perspective. And then very rapidly, everybody's saying, hang on, let's investigate. Yeah. Um, NASA, okay, well, actually, this is a very important point. No, NASA actually published just a week ago, totally verifying the importance of these hydrological dynamics, each of those eight key parts of the hydrological process. NASA, from their space analysis, looking at leaf area index, relationship to temperature, were totally verifying that global Earth systems dynamic of these processes. And again, there's links to the NASA verification of that, if you like, on our website. Beautiful, that's wonderful. Um, uh, Norm, uh, Walter, can you explain uh, how soil fungal biomass can stop wildfires? I live in a wildfire zone and would love to understand the science behind your statement. I don't- Okay, very simple. Basically, every bit of fuel can either basically sit there on the surface, oxidize and wait till it gets burnt, or it can be basically then biodegraded back by fungi into stable soil carbon. So for wildfire management is can we accelerate the biodegradation, bioconversion of that biomass fuel into stable soil carbon. It's a simple matter of accelerating the natural fungal processes in the forest in situ to do that. And yes, we're working and we've got trials and experiments, demonstrations confirming that. All right. Um, people keep posting and then my, my question is that's ready to be answered disappears <laughs> from my, it's my screen. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Uh, Bill Mars, I think this is a, just a nice point. I was uh, farming in Ohio and I hit 80. Most young people left the farm and the older farmers all sold out to big corporate farms. The big farms cut down the hedgerows in the woods. They doubled the acres that being farmed in 10 years. So I just want to make a point about this. If for those who you know have remember flying in airplanes across the US in the wintertime, you can see or fall through winter, or spring, you see these massive um, areas that are bare soil, uh, brown, bare soil. And at the beginning, you said something about 4% more cover, 4% longer. Um, I yep. think, you know, the cover crop piece that the, that the NRCS has been pushing so strongly here in, in North America, in the US, um, just go back, if you would, to a few of those things about the practical logistics of that ground cover and, um, you know, how we can integrate. And there's a few questions in here about polycultures and permaculture. Um, yeah. We don't have time for, but. Look, uh, totally. It, it's a question of maximizing ground cover for longer, and it's a longer that is important because if you just simply say it's area times times, right? That's the amount of bare land that's exposed. That bare land is heating up and that bare land is re-radiating massively more. So if we can drop the area times times that the soil is bare, exposed, re-radiating and heating, we can massively change it. Again, it's one of these metrics. We've never looked at time as a factor in land management production. We've always looked at yield and rate and speed, but not the longevity of green. And that's in a sense what the NASA work was all about. It was looking at leaf area, green indexes across the planet and relating that to then basically hydrology and temperature. And so that's, again, a powerful force multiplier time. If we can get water into soils retained, then we can keep plants growing in that soil for 200 days. If we let it drain and run away, then we may only grow for 20 days. That's yeah. a thousand percent, tenfold difference in the longevity of green, profound. I'll just uh, follow up on that P Roberts again. Um, speaking for the children in the audience and making a simplification, maybe wrong. If 50% less greenery on the earth is the cause of more carbon in the air, so then it's quite simple to put it, to pull it back to earth. We must increase greenery on earth, which means to tend them with water, it's simple. Yep, it, it's, I mean, like for children and for, for everybody, you know, it's just a simple logic, right? We have basically, I mean, 
I mean, that's, yeah, we were running on 50% of green in the terms of forest. We've removed basically, there were 8 billion hectares of primary forest on this planet. We took out 6.3 billion hectares of it. Some of it's regenerated. This is UNEP data. So we've taken out 75% of the primary forest on this planet. You can't avoid it. Yes, we've got to regenerate, rehydrate, longevity of green, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, one thing people don't understand is the role agriculture has played in North Africa and, you know, Central Europe. I mean, there's such big portions of this planet that, you know, historically were green and were much more balanced. And it seems to me, if we can begin to look at that, you know, I don't think people are really consider the major areas in South Asia and Central Africa, et cetera. Yeah. No, look, I agree. I'm just coming back another thing. Like we, we farm crop 1.5 billion hectares of the planet. There's 14 billion hectares of land. So it's about 10%, right? But yeah. of that crop land, it's rare exposed for 60% of the time at the moment under our current system, bare fallow and what have you, right? So even that 1.5 billion hectares, 60% of the time, it's not growing, I mean, it's not green, protected and covered. Now we're changing that with cover cropping and what have you, but it just says what a profound effect we have on keeping soils bare. And of course, in that oxidizing, degrading, warming. Yeah, no, I think I mean, you said before 4% more cover. So, you know, that you could get that 4% more cover just through yep. agricultural yep. land. We don't need to do anything else anywhere on the planet. Um, the numbers. Yeah. Are well. We, yeah. Okay. It's. It, yes. Oh, great. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have. I have my father here to my side. I'm not sure you remember Jack. I'm sure you do. Yeah. Of course, Jack. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Jack. <laughs> Greetings. Greetings. Hi, Walter. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm wonderful. You, um, you you were explaining the uh, the for, the effect of transpiration in cooling the land areas, and of course, with it with it. Uh, Water comes down again in some form as, as precipitation. That that heat is re is reestablished. Can you can you explain a little bit more how we can get benefit out of that analysis? Uh, no, look, okay, thank you. Very important, Jack. And um, when we talked about the transpiration taking heat from the surface up into the upper atmosphere, most of that heat, if we, uh, is then retransmitted back out to space because certainly as that water condenses from water vapor back to water, liquid water, it will release the heat, but that's now at the top of the troposphere. And from there, most of it radiates back out to space. I see. Okay, so it won't come back down. So it doesn't come back down to the earth with a rainfall. So basically we're taking, it's a conveyor taking heat up, certainly releasing it in the air when it condenses, most of it then dissipates to space, and then the rain coming down is cool. So it's a continual cooling process rather than restoring heat back to the earth via rain. All right, a very, very helpful point. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, we've used up uh, your hour and a half, Walter. This is great to have so many questions and lots of people posting uh, links in the in the chat to websites and reports and scientists and things like that so um, those who want to this is all be it'll all be saved and available uh, in the recording for people to review later uh, any final final co comments you'd like to leave us well with? look uh, thank you Dan and look what I'm really trying to say is of course we're opening a whole new Pandora's box of opportunities and positive natural solutions. And yes, I'm delighted to have that inquiry and the questioning and the further investigation because this is, yeah, we're climbing out of a black hole and we're looking at new horizons, right? So please explore, ask critical questions. And basically, yeah, we're into new horizons, but we must embrace those rapidly because yes, we can cool. Yes, we can naturally save this uh, climate, but we've got to do it in the next decade, no question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 you know, from when I first saw your presentation three years ago out in California, I was like, okay, this is great. <laughs> this, we actually, you know, I, I, I knew I wasn't worried for some reason. I didn't know what it was. 
Um, like, it, you know, it's not like this existential crisis. We do have the opportunity to turn this thing around in, in relatively short order. So thank you for bringing the hard science to us. Um, yeah, and of course it is then up to us because we are now response able. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful, I love that framing. Well, thank you, thank you again, Walter. And look forward to seeing you um, on your next presentation. Okay, all the best. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.